I guess one of the not criticisms, David, but one of the the, the queries um, around changing one's decision making um, and considering a lot more the the ecology of mm. one's property. Um, you know, why? How does one get around that? How do, how do you answer that that sort of a query? You know, because people would go, well, if I'm going to plant more trees, I've got less ground to graze cattle or grow crops or, you know, that's money that I could be putting into, um, you know, other, other, other inputs. Sure. You know, how, how would one justify that um, change of, uh, of, of priority and, and, and yeah. change in decision making? Okay. Uh, well, the way I approached that, um, Charlie, was uh, I've started looking around for, for how the world functions and it's been functioning pretty well without humans most of its existence. So a, lot, I, a lot better, I'll, I reckon. Well, so possibly. <laughs> However, we have got this extraordinary society and the way of life that we all love and don't want to give up. Yeah. But the thing that drove me was uh, how does the world uh, arrange its own affairs? And we better start taking notice of how it does that because it's a very long-term um, prospect. It's been going, life's been going on for 3.7 billion years. Uh, there's sure, surely some good lessons there. The, the hallmark is uh, complexity and diversity. Elaboration and diversity of life forms is the, the natural trend of evolution. Uh, now, when you look around at farming, uh, of course, we end up simplifying the living community on our farms. So we were trying to, we were, uh, we're not total idealists, but um, we were trying to get a farming system that the consequences of our management led to diversity. And that is absolutely possible. It's so simple, it's not, it's un, un, unusual that not more people are doing it, to be honest. But, um, but it, it does require some, some thinking and trying to understand things. Uh, and I'd encourage anyone who's getting involved with this not to just do a course and do nothing else. You've got to keep on reading and informing yourself. Don't wait for others to um, do all the thinking for you. It, it actually puts you in the driver's seat of thinking. So um, we began looking at um, what I call an allowing behaviour. So if you let the natural world do what it's trying to do, which is it's always trying to be complex. So if you allow it to do that, that's what it'll do. So that meant for us, we, we uh, were intervening less um, and allowing um, the natural world to start to recomplicate. And when you think of grazing on a farm, um, you know, trees are important. Um, we've, we've increased the tree cover here from about 3% to nearly 20%. You can actually uh, have 30% of your land in trees and you'll suffer no um, production disbenefits. It won't be a disbenefit to have up to 30% of trees. That's a well accepted worldwide figure. So don't be worried about uh, how much land you're taking up. Ultimately, it's going to benefit you. Yeah. Um, but the landscape generally is not all trees. It's mostly grass. So that's the thing to manage. And, and you can really do that well with planned grazing because you work out how much time you need for the pastures to recover. So uh, it, it is incredibly simple, but it's not easy. David, back to your point about you know, in monoculture sort of situation, we, you know, there's a, a big reduction in diversity, you know, where, where, you know, you've got a few species in pasture or one species in a cropping situation. And people do that, farmers do that, for the main reason to have more control, don't they? But, it, but it's, it, but the, I guess the irony of that is that they, they do it to have more control and simplify the system they're trying to manipulate and, and produce from. But in, yep. in the end, it actually, they lose control in a way because they get stuck in a rotation of whether it's simply a crop rotation or a herbicide rotation or, a, or an input in, input cycle. Like it's it's a really interesting situation. Yeah, it is, and it's actually. I mean, agriculture uh, has been an incredible benefit to human beings. It's what allowed the Enlightenment to take happen, uh, to to take place, and all the incredible advances in technology, etc. They're all down to agriculture. Before agriculture. Uh, people didn't have time to reflect on um, their situation and and make all these improvements that we're the, we're the beneficiaries of. But uh, the question is, 
how long can that persist? You know, there's, there is no, um, there's no natural system that has a perpetual upside in growth. There is always uh, a correction. And as, as things become more complex, so more energy needs to go into maintenance to retain that complexity. Now what agriculture does is it simplifies things. So exactly as you say, uh, it, it um, allows you to control uh, the amount of production you get. You're, you're harvesting all the sunlight from that particular la landscape. Say in a crop situation, all that solar energy goes into the benefit of yourself. But when you simplify the landscape to the point where it can no longer provide for its own diversity and complexity to be retained, then you become responsible for doing that and for supplying all those goods and services that the complex community can do for itself. You then become responsible for that and that's all the, they're all the costs of uh, industrial agriculture that we know today. And that's why it's hard to make a profit at it because the costs are so high. So you can't get away from, at the moment, we can't imagine a cropping system uh, that can be anything but one, one species. But uh, there are certainly places in the world where um, people are thinking very hard about how to have multi-species cropping systems. We don't, we're still in the infancy of how to actually do that, but it's probably going to be a very important thing for the future.